Let's go to the Lord in prayer one more time uh, before we get into his word. Heavenly Father, we, uh, we do come to you, and um, Lord, we thank you for all those great things that you have done uh, again. And uh, Lord, we, we do ask uh, that we would, um, again, leave um, those things that are concerning us right now at your feet um, as we hear from your word. And uh, one, one thing that we uh, do uh, hear and that we can do according to your word um, here in 1 John 1, 9, it says, if we, if we, those of us that are, um, have been, that have received the gospel of Christ, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And this is not something, Lord, as we understand your scripture, uh, we have been justified freely by your grace. Uh, we, we have been freed from sin's penalty, uh, but Lord, in our daily walk, um, we, we sin uh, and we break fellowship. And uh, just so that we can be in fellowship with you, Lord, we want to take a few seconds uh, just to quietly uh, uh, confess anything that may have broken our fellowship with you. And uh, so that we might be uh, restored and ready to hear uh, what your spirit has for us today. And so just take a few seconds. And uh, if there's anything you need to bring before the Lord, um, bring it boldly to him. Father, we, we do thank you again, uh, Lord, for your faithfulness. We thank you that you are a God that we can trust. Lord, that your mercies are new every morning. Uh, your loving kindness, Lord, never uh, comes to, your mercies never come to an end. And, and uh, Lord, you're, you, you're just a God of, of, of grace, Lord, and, and, and just waiting and, um, Lord, wanting all to be saved, Lord. That is your will, that is your desire, that all, Lord, would, would change their mind about, um, about who you are and simply trust you for salvation. And so, Lord, we pray for that today. If, um, Lord, we pray for, for people to, to change their mind today as they respond to your word. And we, uh, Lord, just again pray uh, for us as believers to, to continue to um, be teachable, to continue to uh, to be sanctified, and that is your will for those that have trust, uh, trusted you for salvation. And so, Lord, we thank you again that we can get together and that we can study your word. And uh, uh, just, again, just all your marvelous works, uh, we bring glory and honor to you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so it's been a little bit since we uh, have gotten together for our study in Romans. And... Uh, so with that, um, I'd actually just like to, uh, uh, well, before I tell you what, before we get started, I want to bring something to you, uh, your attention. It's a noteworthy event that occurred, and because of the holidays, I didn't get to share it right away, but it was about three weeks ago, and you may have read about it, <clears throat> but it's, uh, you'll see its relevance to our study as we're uh, in Romans uh, chapter 1. And uh, we, we've been studying about the, the wrath of God uh, in 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in, in unrighteousness. And um, we're, we're actually starting today in, in 24, uh, and we'll probably make it, we probably won't make it all the way through uh, 32, but... Um, but anyway, I just wanted to share this with you. Um, on uh, December 12th, 2023, at 8.41 p.m., uh, Fox News Digital, this is the morning of technical difficulty, sorry. Fox News uh, Digital um, uh, article published, 
uh, reported by, um, excuse me, by breaking news reporter Greg Werner um, reported this, a Turkish lawmaker, Hassan Bitmez, had a heart attack and fell to the ground in parliament on Tuesday after declaring that Israel will not be able to escape the wrath of God, according to reports. Werner quotes Bitmez as saying, even if history remains silent, the truth will not remain silent. They think that if they get rid of us, there will be no problem. Bitmez said in a translated version of his speech, however, if you get rid of us, you will not be able to escape the torment of conscience. Even if you escape the torment of history, you will not be able to escape the wrath of God. He then turned and fainted, hitting his head on the ground in what appeared to be a marble floor. Two days later, on December 14th, 2023, the New York Post reported that Turkish lawmaker who had, had a heart attack after saying Israel will suffer the wrath of Allah dies. And I share this with you not in a, in a, in a, uh, a manner of, of anything other than, than just in awe because God is not, you know, what he tells, what he tells us in his word again is that, and I'm sorry, I think my battery might be dying. There it is. In Genesis 12, 3, I just want to remind us of this. And this was his promise to Abram. I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So I just want to share this with you in the severity too of, 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 the, of God's word and the promise that he makes. And this should bring a soberness, but, and hopefully it'll, it'll set up the understanding of today's teaching as well. But know this, you know, God does not delight in this. This is not something that, you know, God is waiting to, for somebody to make a mistake but this is somebody that has a position that God has given him of authority and has been placed there. And over and over again, he has suppressed the truth in unrighteousness. And, and God will use people, you know, all throughout history. It is relevant. You know, God's word is relevant. And this is what the Lord has to say um, re regarding these, th these things. I'm having a real bad delay on this. He says in Ezekiel 33, 11, say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure. I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. You see, God is not pleased by these things and God is not pleased by allowing these things to come upon people. But that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn. Turn from your evil ways. For why should you die? And this is to the house of Israel, O house of Israel. So God will bring his judgment upon people, sometimes instantaneously and when it is, is appropriate. And this is something that God is, is warning. Hey, look, you know, these, these are still, Israel is still God's, they're still God's people. And uh, some people might write it off as mere coincidence or chance or whatever, but, uh, but believe me, you know, God, God, will, God will deal with those um, that don't believe and that are uh, bringing, and trust me, uh, he goes on to say and curse a lot more regarding Israel. And there are those today uh, that continue in this manner. Uh, but for, for, for this and for us, this should bring us into uh, a, a sobriety of, of uh, you know, who, who God is and, and how he's, he has allowed this thing to happen. 
You know, God gives us our very breath, and, um, and God has given them their very breath. And in this case, you know, this, this individual cursed Israel and uh, received an instant, um, you know, an instant, uh, an instant judgment. So with that being said, let's, let's quickly re- refresh our memories on what we learned uh, the last time we met. Again, it's been about three weeks. So, uh, so we, we left off, we noted three reasons for the wrath of God as pointed out by John Whitmer. Uh, they were for suppressing God's truth in verse 118, for ignoring God's revelation, 119 through 20, and for perverting God's glory in 121 through 23. And, and may I remind you, uh, you know, in these verses we observed then closer how mankind, and specifically those uh, that were without, this is all prior, this is a historical um, a chapter pertaining to those that are outside of the law, prior to the law. So, so they were, in essence, they weren't Jewish. Uh, they were uh, just uh, immoral sinners is what we've kind of tagged them with. So since the beginning of time, uh, mankind actively and volitionally perverts the glory of, glo- of God, and that's about where we left off last time in 21 and 23. So, so we, we learned a little then for purposes of our study about the Greek, um, uh, Greek verb voice. And the main idea of the Greek verb is that it re- reveals, or the voice of the verb, is that it reveals if the subject is doing the action or if it is receiving the action. So, so is, is the verb then um, applied to, uh, or, or is the subject then the one doing the action or is it receiving the action? And we noted that a verb's grammatical voice can be active, passive, or middle. Now we're just concerned with active and passive right now before we get into middle because that's a bit more complex. Uh, so that's why I just have the two up there now. So when a Greek verb is in the active voice, it simply means that the subject of the sentence is performing the action. So whatever the subject of the, senten- the sentence is, is performing the action. Again, we use the, the dog ate, m- ate the ball or ate my homework. And so the dog then is doing the action. Um, and then uh, if it's passive, oops, did you guys do that? Okay, sorry. Um, if it's passive, the subject receives the action of the verb. So, so in other words, if the dog ate the ball and the dog, or if the, the, the dog ate the homework and then the dog got sick, well, the dog got sick as a resulting of eating that, but it's, it, it received the action of being sick. So, so in that case, it is, it is a passive. So, so, but it is a result typically of, of, a, of, of an action. So it's, but it's in a passive voice, meaning that the action happened to the subject. So applying this to our verse, we looked at because although they knew God, they did not glorify active. And we noted that was a negative action. They did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful active voice, but became futile passive, so now resulting from not glorifying and not thankful, they became futile in their thoughts. So the sin affected their thoughts. And then their foolish hearts were darkened, resulting from those things. Professing now, see now they've gone from inaction to an action. Now they're professing to be wise. They became fools, passive voice, and changed actively the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. So, if you see what's happening here, 
even though they knew God, they did not. These are negative actions, meaning that it's something they didn't do, but it was, it was out, of, um, out of a response to knowing God. They chose not to glorify him. They chose not to be thankful. And as a result of that, they became futile in their thoughts. It changed their thinking. And then their foolish hearts were darkened resulting also from this. So now it's gone from, from thinking to this thing that has been you know, kindled in, 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 their, in their heart, in their understanding inwardly. And so now they begin to profess outwardly in the active voice to be wise. Now they're saying, look, I'm wise because you know, they're, they're promoting themselves. They're beginning to glorify themselves and not glorify God. I'm wise, I have knowledge. And in this, then, it says they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and even birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. So you start to see this downward spiral, and that's what we're looking at, is, is how man then... In, and even though this is historical, as we'll see here, uh, we'll talk about that in a minute, but, but, but the point is here is that they made the choice. They actively chose these things. And then as we looked at this, next slide, please. Uh, the results then of the, of the condemnation, this is the full outline of what we'll take a look at uh, in, in one uh, th- uh, or 18 through 32, there's inexcusability, and that's what we saw in, in 18, that they, are in, they have no excuse because these are actions they chose themselves. And then as we looked at uh, just now, prior to tw- uh, 20 th- uh, 23, excuse me, uh, 21 and 22, it goes into irrational thinking. And then from irrationality, It moves into then idolatry, which we began to look at last week and we'll look at further today. Idolatry then goes into immorality, immorality into insanity, insanity into irresponsibility, and then from irresponsibility, no longer are they doing these things, but they are encouraging these things. Does this seem like anything today? Does this seem relevant? Do we see people encouraging in certain manners today, in certain ungodliness and unrighteousness, things that are contrary to life and to light? Do we see the darkness in the world today? This is quite relative today. And we wonder why. And this is why I say this is a spiritual, we are in a spiritual battle. You know, these are things that that without the word of God, and the word of God will bring great clarity and light to our condition as we study God's word today. And, uh, you know, the book of Romans will, will reveal to us how then God's righteousness and the wrath of God, how they both go through. But what appeases the wrath of God? How do we avoid the wrath of God? That's, a, that's the question that should, should be in the forefront of our mind, right? How do we avoid these things? And it's as simple as trusting in the gospel of Christ. Because remember, Paul says the gospel of Christ, it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. There's not... There's nothing added to who genuinely believes, who, who positively believes, no, who really, really, really believes. It's who believes the gospel of Christ, who trusts that God's work is sufficient to save you. There's no other condition placed on it. It is simply faith in Christ alone. My works add nothing to salvation because we looked at over and over again what our works are. Our works are unclean. Our works are filthy. Our works are distorted by us knowing evil and good. 
You see, we know evil and we can't, we can't, you know, apart from, uh, apart from be, being renewed by the washing of the water of the word, our minds, we, we, we have trouble separating what is good, you know, what is righteous and what is, is not. And we have issue then with, with, with things that, you know, when God brings judgment or when God brings these things or when we witness these things, we have trouble reconciling them. You know, and, and, and this is what Paul is saying here. Look, man chooses his own way. He chooses what to do with this truth and he suppresses it. Now, now for us that have believed, obviously God deals with his children differently than those that have not believed rather than children that still have the wrath of God abiding upon them because they've not received his son. So we looked at the irrational thinking of the immoral sinner and verses 21 through 22, next slide. It says, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God nor were thankful but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. And then we looked at the, from the irrationality then into idolatry. Um, and we defined idolatry in accordance with the ISB encyclopedia as not only the giving, and this is why this, is, this applies to this verse, not only the, the giving to any creature or human creation, the honor and devotion which belong to God alone, but the giving to any human desire a precedence over God's will. In other words, when we exalt our own desire over the instructed will of God, we are in fact committing the sin of idolatry. And this is what they were doing. So in their inaction, they were, they were already committing the sin of idolatry when they were exalting their desire then above the, uh, the instructed will of God. So, next slide, please. So it says then here, resulting from mankind's refusal to do what is natural and worship the incorruptible creator, they began to worship the corrupt, corruptible created thing. So this then is, it says they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. So this is the beginning then of humanism and idolatry. Next slide, please. Um, and as you can see in our outline here, we've uh, in, in point two there under A, the ungodliness of humankind. So we're, we're dealing here in this portion with, with humanism, which is simply idolatry. But humanism, as defined by Chester McCallie, is a, is a way of thinking where all doctrines, and I follow this, a way of thinking where all doctrines, all attitudes, and all ways of life center on the values and interests of man. Man is the object of humanism and the source of it. So in other words, you know, humanism is simply saying, I am God. The human is God. Because everything centers this narcissistic thinking around, around me. You know, it's all applicable to me. It's about me. Everything's about me. So a way of thinking where all doctrines, all attitudes, and all ways of life center on the values and interests of man. You see, God is interested and has been interested in glorifying himself and glorifying his salvation and his good works and what he does. And religion and man comes along and we take it and we make it about us. We make it about our good works. And in our self-righteousness then and in our self-righteous deeds, just like the Pharisees, we become those promoting, look at me, look at my good works, look at how good I am, you know, look at what I've done, look at what I can do. And, and we are not promoting the image of God in those things. You know, and that's, that's, that's why it's so important to, 
appropriately understand Scripture and understand what it's saying in its context. You know, not just cherry picking verses and applying them to me, applying them to me, but rather, what is God? How does God want me to behave? How does God want me to be sanctified so that I can be then these things to the world? And it's not a self-produced righteousness. It's not me just trying to obey God's law and obey his word so that I can please God and whatever. That's not it. Grace, by definition, is unmerited, undeserved favor. And when we receive the grace of God, then, and when we understand fully the grace of God, it has salvation. Yes, I am saved but salvation is of the Lord. It has nothing to do with me. It has nothing to do with my action. But God saved me while I was still a sinner, while I was, the Bible says, that I was in rebellion. I was at enmity. I was at war with God prior to believing him, prior to trusting him. And so those, those things then, my, my actions, you know, I simply understood a need for salvation and someone brought the gospel message of Christ and him crucified and his shed blood for remission of sin and I trusted that. I received the grace of God simply and, and in that then you are born again. Now these things again, which is why we're going through the book of Romans, and this is why Paul is writing and explaining all these things, is to encourage them. Look, this is, this is us prior to believing, okay? This is who we were, and this is where the world is. This is what the world was, it's what it is, and it's what it's going to be, you know, until, until things are made new. And so, so all these things that we're looking at then here in Romans uh, are, are simple encouragements then to us. This is where the world is. And he's going to say, you know, again, that we were saved from this, uh, that we are no longer under the penalty of sin. And this is encouragement and should be encouragement to us to then serve freely in his grace and to freely give that which we freely received. So, verse 20, 24. Go on the next slide, please. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the nat natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another. Men with men, committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. Next slide. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who, knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Now, remember, again, our, according to immediate context, these verses are the results of the wrath of God being revealed historically 
upon mankind's ungodliness and unrighteousness. Paul is talking about the immoral sinner in the past who suppressed the truth of God apart from the law. However, as we will see in chapter 2, the historical account regarding the depravity of man given by Paul in these verses remain unchanged throughout all of history. And remember the point he says here in, in, in 18, for the wrath of God is, and we looked at that, that is a present tense, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. So it hasn't, uh, you know, again, even though God has progressively revealed the truth of his righteousness over time and in these last days in his son, mankind still the idea is that they barter away the truth of God when they exchanged. They bartered it away. I'm going to barter the truth of God away. Just as God's wrath against ungodliness and unrighteousness hasn't changed, neither has mankind's suppression of the truth in unrighteousness reformed. Man still plays the same thing. Even with the given amount of revelation that we have, all the way through his word of, of who he is and his goodness, man still suppresses this, even with the gospel of Christ. And think about it, those people that saw and witnessed Christ and him crucified, they still, even in that truth, still deny him. They still denied him. Which is why the word says, blessed is he who has not seen and believes. You know, that's, that's us. We didn't witness the crucifixion, but we, we trust its sufficiency for our salvation. So, going back to verse 24, let's go through this. Next slide, please. Therefore, God also gave, here it is again, active voice. Now God is doing the action. You see this? All the way to verse 24, who's doing the action? The immoral sinner. Until God doesn't actively get involved here until verse 24. As, as interfering with what, what they're doing. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness. Now, he has given them up as a result of humanity's idolatry, now that they are worshiping the, crea the creature, the created thing, God gave them over to uncleanness. Next slide, please. So uncleanness is simply moral impurity or defilement. According to, to BDAG, um, and we've defined that in the past, it's a, it's a long group of, People, but it's a Greek English lexicon of the New Testament. A state of moral corruption is what we're dealing with, or, or violent, vileness, especially of sexual sins. So God gave them up to things that are unnatural, unnatural vices. God gave them over. You see, in God's action here, he is acting judicially as the judge and gives them over to the lustful desires of their hearts. It's like when a, when a judge sentences and gives someone over to their deed, what they've done. He just hands them over to, to receive the due penalty for what their actions are. So God hands them over to the lustful desires of their hearts. Robert, Mount, Robert Mounts explains how God's wrath is revealed against the immoral sinner's idolatry. Next slide, please. He says, God's wrath, mentioned in Romans 1, is not an active outpouring of divine displeasure, but, but the removal of restraint that allows sinners to reap the just fruits of their rebellion. Moral degradation is a consequence of God's wrath, not the reason for it. Does that make sense? Moral degradation is a consequence of God's wrath, not the reason for it. Sin inevitably creates its own penalty. Divine judgment 
is God permitting people to go their own way. He releases the reins. It's as if God says, okay, your heart's desire is to live without truth. I will begin to hand you over to a life devoid of truth. You want to worship these things? Okay. You want to go into idolatry? Okay. Now, this is simply God allowing things to take its course. And now at some point, you know, the purpose behind it, um, as we could see, because we could look at two, two accounts. We could look at the purpose for the immoral sinner, and just to wrap that up in summary would be so that they would understand their need for salvation, so that they would not just hit rock bottom, but that they would be flat on their face and that they might roll over and look up and understand their need for salvation. And now for the believer, here's my question, we still sin. And we have testaments in the book. You know, Paul writes two letters to the church at Corinth. And we see over and over again this encouragement for people to live a godly life. And it's not, it's not to demonstrate how righteous I am, but rather to demonstrate the goodness of God. It's so that we are representatives of Christ. It's, 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 not, it's not to bring glory and honor to us. And it's not for us to get mad at others if they're not. You know, as we're starting our study in the book of James, you know, we'll understand like, hey, you know, you come along beside someone if you can and encourage them and exhort them unto good works. You don't, you don't come along, you know, just like you wouldn't, you know, again, you know, if your own child was, you know, if, they're, if they were a baby and they were, you know, learning how to, how to speak and they say something incorrect, you don't just like smack them across the face and tell them they're, you know, if you don't straighten up, you're going to hell, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you don't, you don't do that. That's unnatural. So, so, you know, my question is, why is this being done in the church today? You know, no, it's, it's, let's get into the word of God and, and let's see why we don't do these things. And just as a, we have a love and desire for our own children to be saved from things that are harmful, such as the word of God, because our creator knows us. He knows even the, our hearts and their desires. And this is where God works in us. So notice, if we look back at these verses, notice that these are inward lusts. These are lusts of the heart. So if we look back at 21, because although they knew God, they did not glorify his God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts. And their foolish hearts were darkened. You see, resulting again from the suppression of truth, they became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were dark, darkened. Our thoughts, our thoughts are the seedbed of sin. Sin is birthed from our own desires. Sin is birthed from our own desires. As James, James explains to us, next slide please. Uh, I skip one next slide actually. It says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one, now remember, these, this is to Christian. This is to instruction to the believer, what we talked about this morning. Each one, each one of us is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed then 
when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Now, James here in this context, again, is not talking about separation from God. This is divine discipline. This is God reserves the right if, if a person continues in a certain sin, and we've seen people, you know, uh, I'm, we know people, we know people that have continued into drug abuse and have died from it. You know, we know people that have continued in sexual sin and have caught diseases and died from it. You know, this is practically lived out every day. So, this is why we are to cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You see, for us, it, it is, yes, things filter in through our eyes, our ears, but it, it all begins, the battlefield is really in our mind. It is what we meditate on. It is what we, we, we focus on, the things that we then give ourselves to, you know, what we allow ourselves to see, what we allow ourselves to hear, what those things, you know, those thoughts that, that are, are brewed in our mind then, that's, that's why I say it's the, you know, it's the seedbed of sin. And this is what, where they even started. It was their thoughts. It began with, with their thoughts. And what happened then is their, because it began with their thoughts, and as we'll see, they become, they have a debased mind. They, then their mind is seared. So, so it comes in, it's brewed, it goes out. And then as we sin then, what happens is, is, is uh, or as they sin, God handed them over and then ultimately they became debased in their thinking. Their, their thoughts then even turned to where they couldn't even, they didn't even have the truth of God in them, but they believed a lie. So, so again, us as Christians, practically in, in, in an applicational way, these are things that we do. We, we cast down these imaginations. Anything, it says, that exalts it, itself against the knowledge of God. And then it's only to the obedience of Christ that we can bring these things into captivity. And as we will also discover in Romans, depravity moves from the inside of man to the outside of man. So as the lustful desires of the heart give way to outward sin in the body, it ultimately affects the ability to control our mind. And this is where then habitual sin, addiction, and all those things, and this is why those at Corinth and, and others were struggling with this. And now what was the moral discipline Remember, the man, the, if you look back at the church at Corinth, like, no, I'll be the first to say that I, I would be, I don't know that I would want to pastor the church at Corinth, but, but of all the things that were going on, all the issues, and the main, you know, the main one of all those things was a sexual sin, and it was, it wasn't just that they were in sin and trying to, struggling with it, and under, understanding their need to be saved from it, but they came in boastfully, and it was a man and his mother-in-law, and they were having sex, and they came in promoting their relationship boastfully. Look at us. And the church received it. Nobody said anything. And Paul says, put that one out for the destruction of the flesh, turn him over to Satan, for the destruction of the flesh to save his soul so that he might be saved. Not that he wasn't saved from the penalty of sin, but he had presented himself now and he had, he had presented himself instead of being a bond servant of, servant of Christ, he's now a bond servant of that sexual sin. He willingly handed himself over to that sin after being free. And so now 
his mind has changed in a negative way and his spiritual growth is, you know, he's sitting there in his poopy diaper and boasting about it, you know? That's what he's doing. You know, I, I saw a, a, a rather atrocious thing the other day, it was just struck me and it was a full grown adult uh, driving down the road, I look over and they're sucking their thumb. I was like, really? You know, <laughs> what is that? But that, that's a picture of, of, you know, the Christian who is not, you know, that's, that's a good picture of him. You know, he, he's a, he, was a, he should have been at that time, as Paul said, you know, he, he, he should have been grown, you know, and matured in his faith, and, and he's actually gone the other direction. And Paul says, you know, again, you guys are doing things that aren't even mentioned among the Gentiles. Like, you know, in the church, you're doing these things. And so that's not where, that's not the will of God for the church, and that's not the will of God, but God says, hand him over to Satan for the destruction of flesh so that his soul might be saved, so that he might come to change his mind and so that he can be restored. But you've got to, you can't touch that one. You've got you to, again, allow those passive things to happen to him so, so that uh, you know, Satan can deal with him and treat him how Satan wants to treat him, as he did Job, and not that Job was in, uh, you know, don't, don't make that correlation. Job was not in, the, in a uh, position that this guy was in. Job was not in sin in that regard, but, but this one was so that uh, he might be restored to fellowship. That was the whole thing, and that's, what, and that's how God deals with his children. He reserves the right to divinely discipline his children and, and to, to spank them on the bottom and get them back in line. Um, and, and, you know, I've, I've been personally spanked, so, uh, and I wouldn't encourage it, so. But anyway, we'll, we'll see this as we go on in Romans, how, how it begins then, the thoughts begin in the mind, they're, they're festered in the heart, then when they are, the sin comes out in the body, and you actually sin in the body, then these things start to affect then the mind, to a point to where it can become uh, seared. And so that's why, you know, that's why we are to flee from sin, flee lustful use. You know, we are to flee from sexual immorality. So it says here then, as we go to the next slide, God gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. So God then, resulting from the results of their hearts, they now have dishonored their own bodies. You see that? They dishonored their own body. And this is what happens today. Now, you know, the, the community that is involved in this will say no, you know, we're bringing dishonor to them. But this is saying, no, you, you made this choice. You're without excuse. You, you, you made this choice. This was not natural. It's unnatural. As much as the world would want to make you believe that sexual immorality is natural, according to the Word of God, it is quite unnatural. It's a place that we get to. And now let me make this clear this is not a place for bigotry or hatred. This is, a, this is a place, again, we bring good news to people that you can be saved from these things. You, you can be saved from these things. As long as you have breath in your lungs and animation in your body, you're on this side. You, God has given you grace. God is extending grace to you. And God is calling to you to taste and see that He is good, not these things. So, again, resulting from the lust of their hearts, they've dishonored their own bodies. They cannot blame their di dishonor on anyone else because they've done this to themselves. And this is why, again, next slide, please. Flee sexual immorality. 
Every sin that man does is outside the body. But he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. This is why these are, these are warnings. This is, this is love from our creator that says, look, I know what's best for you. I know your desires. I know the desires of your heart. And I want to give you new desires. But, but you have to trust, first of all, if you haven't trusted for salvation, you trust for salvation. If you're a believer and you're dealing with these things, then, then again, as we prayed, it is as simple as 1 John 1, 9. We confess these things to the Lord. He is faithful and just to forgive us, you know, of not only the sin, but all unrighteousnesses, all, all of our unrighteousness. God is faithful. And so he, he wants us then to be restored back to fellowship, to change our mind, and to start growing in the grace and knowledge of God. You see, ultimately, man exchanged knowing good for knowing evil. As stated earlier, they bartered away the truth of God for the lie. And please note the Greek definite article. Next slide. Uh, one more, maybe. There it is. The Greek definite article, the. And we talked about that before. It, is a it means that it is specific. It's not a random. It is as if saying the president of the United States as opposed to a president it is it is cur it is it is specific as well as the singularity next slide of truth and lie this is a specific truth of god and a specific lie that is being dealt with this is what they exchanged it for they exchanged the truth of god for the lie remember the truth of god was in their conscience and observable in creation itself. The lie is the original lie from the father of lies. Turn with me to Genesis 3, 4 through 5. And, yep, yeah, thank you. It says, Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. You see, the lie that mankind believed is that they would be like God. Now how, let's put this into perspective. Suppress God's truth and you will be like him? What? <laughs> Disobey God's instruction and you'll be like him? Through disobedience becomes godliness no you see how they were duped and why is that and we've been talking about their desires this is why john warns us next slide please first john 2 16 for all that is in the world the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is what? Of the world. Now watch this. Going back to Genesis 3, 6. Next slide. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food. Next slide. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food the lust of the flesh, good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, next slide, lust of the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, next slide, the pride of life. She took of its fruit and ate. 
You see how they were, how she was deceived. And let's make that clear. The woman was deceived. And I believe that the man was given the directive prior to, to Eve being created from his side. And it was the man's responsibility, men, us, to bring this word, to bring this message to the wife, to wash her in the water of the word, to bring these things to her, to bring God's instruction to her. This was Adam's role. The inference as you read it, when she turned and offered him the fruit. Tree, she turns and offers him the fruit. Was he standing right there? I mean, the Bible does not say that. So, but the inference is that yes, he was right there. When you read it, it's hard to separate him being somewhere else and there's some other time, but this is all happening with Adam standing right there. And he wasn't, he wasn't protecting his wife, nor was he correcting what was being stated, but he passively stood by. And uh, so, and that's why through one man's sin entered the world because it was a direct order from God to Adam and Adam just disobeyed. Now, and, but there's much to be said about if Adam knew, if Adam knew the consequence of that sin, how much did he love his wife? Knowing that she had done something that would bring separation from God. And there's much that can be said about that, but so, John warns us then, stay away, these are things, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, these are things that are of the world. They are not of God, but rather now they are of the world. You see, when mankind rejects the truth of God, it is replaced with lies. Resulting from the rejection of truth, the immoral sinner is given over now to full-blown idolatry. Next slide, please. It says, and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. And Paul says, to distinguish himself, who is blessed forever, amen. So be it, is what that term means. Let it be, let it so be it. This is what they've done, and this is Paul's submission to the will of God, or to the, you know, their inexcusability and how God has handed them over and all these things. God is blessed forever. The Creator is blessed forever, amen. So, and that's probably a good, good place to stop. Um, I wanted to get further, but we didn't. Um, so again, you know, the, I just want to make it clear for anybody, I, I don't want to assume, but the gospel is, is, is simply this. If anybody has their Bible and wants to go to 1 Corinthians 15, 1. Paul in writing to the church at Corinth, again, they're already saved, so understand that this is the most, this is the basis of the gospel message. This is the most that we have collectively in scripture of the work of Christ. It just kind of sums up, if you will. It says, I declare to you the gospel, the good news, which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which also you are saved. 
if you hold fast that word which I preached to you unless you believed in vain. And Paul's going to go on and talk about the, the doctrine of the bodily resurrection of Christ. But he says, I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once. So do you think this would stand up in the court of law? As many people witnessed him? Of whom the greater part remained of the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James. That's, that's his half, Jesus' half-brother, then by all the apostles. The last of all, Paul says, he was seen by me also, as by one born out of due time. And all this to lay testimony to the resurrected Christ. So you see, the God-man Jesus Christ He was crucified according to the scripture. He was buried and he resurrected according to the scripture. And the scripture tells us, because this is an extremely important part, that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. You see, this had to happen. In order for sin to be remissed, in order for the penalty of sin to be paid for, and also in order for the law to be completed, to be fulfilled, Christ had to die. Because he lived according to the law. He was under the law when he was on the earth. And he, he died even guiltless of breaking any of the laws. And he, just as a lamb, was inspected, was inspected by the authorities at the time. He was sent to Pilate. He was sent to Herod. I found no blemish in him. I find no fault in this lamb. I find nothing wrong with him. He was the perfect sacrifice made for you and I. And he shed his blood for the remission of our sin for us. And that's what had to happen in order for man to be reconciled to God. He was buried and death couldn't hold him again because when he came to death, you see, what's the penalty of sin? Death. Did Christ sin? No. Death could not hold him because he was sinless. But he took our sin and he absorbed the wrath. Of, the wrath of God then was aimed at him and he took the wrath that was for you and I and he took it to the grave and he buried it. And he brought that sacrifice now as, as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek because remember Melchizedek is an eternal order. We'll get study that further later but, but the point is, is that he is now the priest bringing this before God and God receives it. And the fact that he rose from the dead and the fact that he was received into heaven and the fact that he's seated at the right hand of the Father proves that that sacrifice was acceptable. And so now that's his current role as priest. He is seated at the right hand of the Father making intercessions for you and for I as well as the Holy Spirit. And what is the Holy Spirit also doing? He is convicting the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. And he is convicting then for what reason? So that all might believe. So that those that would believe would believe. And that's where we get to play a part as believers, is that we get on board with what God is doing. And as we then grow and mature and we're equipped and we understand the gospel, then we can go out and we are the missionaries. We are the missionaries here local. We are the ones that go out here. And that's ultimately 
hopefully where we'll get and and for this for us for grace baptist for the new year what we want to do what's just been discussed discussed a little bit is that you know we would like to i would like to go out this year uh, to you know the local fairs and and things of that nature and for us to go out in 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 groups and and bring this gospel message out to these places but you know again it takes it takes time and uh, of course boldness but remember what paul says i'm not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of god unto salvation for everyone who believes to the jew first and also to the greek so in our going then don't be ashamed don't be ashamed of the gospel we're going to face persecution people are going to ridicule people are going to even as we use this building as you know when we're not collectively gathering to glorify and honor god when we use this physical building you know as an outreach to the community and people come in they're still going to ridicule us in here we've already seen that so uh you know it is what it is and uh and in this life you will have tribulation you you will have it we will have it because we are estranged now uh, having believed and having been born again we are strangers and aliens in this world and this world is no longer our home and that's why again uh, john warns us there uh, the lust of the the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes and the pride of life those things are of the world and they're not of the Father. So, Father, again, we, we thank you for this opportunity to get together and to uh, bring glory and honor and to magnify your word, uh, to magnify your instruction for us. And, uh, Lord, may we hopefully leave here with some questions answered and also others raised as we begin to, uh, or as we continue to study through uh, these passages. Um, Lord, may we uh, rightly, um, again, continue to rightly divide your word and understand it in context, um, and um, may we carefully observe before we interpret, and as we interpret, may we um, uh, interpret uh, accordingly to its literal, grammatical, historical, and then continue, Lord, uh, as we apply it, Lord, may we, may we do that uh, um, uh, graciously, and um, and uh, carefully and so father we we thank you for this time and again thank you uh, that you you are working uh, in us and all of us both to will and to do of your good pleasure and uh, we thank you that um, lord you are faithful to complete the work that you began in each of us and uh, may all glory and honor uh, be unto you and uh, in christ's name we pray amen